Section 27 of The Valley of the Moon by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 2, Chapter 12. A gleam of light came when Billy got a job, driving a grading team for the contractors of the big bridge, then building at Niles. Before he went, he made certain that it was a union job, and a union job it was for two days when the concrete workers threw down their tools. The contractors, evidently prepared for such happening, immediately filled the places of the concrete men with non-union Italians, whereupon the carpenters, structural iron workers, and teamsters walked out, and Billy, lacking train fare, spent the rest of the day in walking home. I couldn't work as a scab, he concluded his tale. No, Saxon said, you couldn't work as a scab. But she wondered why it was when men wanted to work, and there was work to do, yet they were unable to work because their unions said no. Why were there unions, and if unions had to be, why were not all working men in them? Then there would be no scabs, and Billy could work every day. Also she wondered where she was going to get a sack of flour, for she had long since ceased the extravagance of baker's bread, and so many other of the neighborhood women had done this also, that the little Welsh baker had closed up shop and gone away, taking his wife and two little daughters with him. Look where she would, everybody was being hurt by the industrial strife. One afternoon a caller came at her door, and that evening Billy came with dubious news. He had been approached that day. All he had to do, he told Saxon, was to say the word, and he could go into the stables as foreman at one hundred dollars a month. The nearness of such a sum, the possibility of it, almost stunning to Saxon, sitting at the supper table, which consisted of boiled potatoes, warmed over beans, and a small dry onion which they were eating raw. There was neither bread, coffee, nor butter. The onion Billy had pulled from his pocket, having picked it up in the street. One hundred dollars a month. She moistened her lips and fought for control. What made them offer it to you, she questioned. That's easy, was his answer. They've got a dozen reasons. The guy the boss has had exercising Prince and King is a dub. King has gone lame in the shoulders. Then they're guessing pretty strong that I'm the party that's put a lot of their scabs out of commission. Macklin's been their foreman for years and years. Why, I was in knee pants when he was a foreman. Well, he's sick and all in. They got to have somebody to take his place. Then, too, I've been with him a long time. And on top of that, I'm the man for the job. Then I know the horses from the ground up, hell. It's all I'm good for, except slugging. Think of it, Billy, she breathed. A hundred dollars a month. A hundred dollars a month. And throw the fellows down, he said. It was not a question, nor was it a statement. It was anything Saxon chose to make of it. They looked at each other. She waited for him to speak. But he continued merely to look. It came to her that she was facing one of the decisive moments of her life. She gripped herself to face it in all coolness. Nor would Billy proffer her the slightest help. Whatever his own judgment might be, he masked it with an expressionless face. His eyes betrayed nothing. He looked and waited. You, you can't do that, Billy, she said finally. You can't throw the fellows down. His hand shot out to hers, and his face was a sudden, radiant dawn. Put her there, he cried, their hands meeting and clasping. You're the truest, true blue wife a man ever had. If all the other fellows had wives like you, we could win any strike we tackled. What would you have done if you weren't married, Billy? Seen him in hell first. Then it doesn't make any difference being married. I've got to stand by you in everything you stand for. I'd be a nice wife if I didn't. She remembered her caller of the afternoon and knew the moment was too propitious to let pass. 
There was a man here this afternoon, Billy. He wanted a room. I told him I'd speak to you. He said he would pay six dollars a month for the back bedroom. That would pay half a month's installment on the furniture and buy a sack of flour. And we're all out of flour. Billy's old hostility to the idea was instantly uppermost, and Saxon watched him anxiously. Some scab in the shops, I suppose. No, he's firing on the freight run to San Jose. Harmon, he said his name was, James Harmon. They just transferred him from the truck key division. He sleeps days mostly, he said, and that's why he wanted a quiet house without children in it. In the end, with much misgiving, and only after Saxon had insistently pointed out how little work it entailed on her, Billy consented though he continued to protest as an afterthought. But I don't want you making beds for any man. It ain't right, Saxon. I ought to take care of you. And you would, she flashed back at him, if you'd take the foremanship. Only you can't. It wouldn't be right. And if I'm to stand by you, it's only fair to let me do what I can. James Harmon proved even less a bother than Saxon had anticipated. For a fireman... He was scrupulously clean, always washing up in the roundhouse before he came home. He used the key to the kitchen door, coming and going by the back steps. To Saxon, he barely said, how do you do, or good day, and sleeping in the daytime and working at night, he was in the house a week before Billy laid eyes on him. Billy had taken to coming home later and later, and going out after supper by himself. He did not offer to tell Saxon where he went, nor did she ask. For that matter, it required little shrewdness on her part to guess. The fumes of whiskey were on his lips at such times. His slow, deliberate ways were even slower, even more deliberate. Liquor did not affect his legs. He walked as soberly as any man. There was no hesitancy, no faltering, in his muscular movements. The whiskey went to his brain, making his eyes heavy-lidded and the cloudiness of them more cloudy. Not that he was flighty, nor quick, nor irritable. On the contrary, the liquor imparted to his mental processes a deep gravity and brooding solemnity. He talked little, but that little was ominous and oracular. At such times there was no appeal from his judgment, no discussion. He knew as God knew, and when he chose to speak a harsh thought, it was tenfold harsher than ordinarily, because it seemed to proceed out of such profundity of cogitation, because it was prodigiously deliberate in its incubation as it was in its enunciation. It was not a nice side he was showing to Saxon. It was almost as if a stranger had come to live with her. Despite herself, she found herself beginning to shrink from him, and little could she comfort herself with the thought that it was not his real self, for she remembered his gentleness and considerateness, and all his fineness of the past. Then he made a continual effort to avoid trouble and fighting. Now he enjoyed it, exalted in it, went looking for it. All this showed in his face. No longer was he the smiling, pleasant-faced boy. He smiled infrequently now. His face was a man's face. The lips, the eyes, the lines were harsh as his thoughts were harsh. It was rarely unkind to Saxon, but on the other hand, he was rarely kind. His attitude toward her was growing negative. He was disinterested. Despite the fight for the union she was enduring with him, putting up with him shoulder to shoulder, she occupied but little space in his mind. When he acted toward her gently, she could see that it was merely mechanical, just as she was well aware that the endearing terms he used, the endearing caresses he gave, were only habitual. The spontaneity and warmth had gone out. Often when he was not in liquor, flashes of the old Billy came back, but even such flashes dwindled in frequency. He was growing preoccupied, moody. Hard times 
and the bitter stresses of industrial conflict strained him. Especially was this apparent in his sleep, when he suffered paroxysms of lawless dreams, groaning and muttering, clenching his fists, grinding his teeth, twisting with muscular tensions, his face writhing with passions and violence, his throat guttering with terrible curses that rasped and aborted on his lips. And Saxon, lying beside him, afraid of this visitor to her bed whom she did not know, remembered what Mary had told her of Bert. He too had cursed and clenched his fists. In his nights fought out the battles of his days. One thing, however, Saxon saw clearly. By no deliberate act of Billy's was he becoming this other and unlovely Billy. Were there no strike, no snarling or wrangling over jobs, there would be only the old Billy she had loved in all absoluteness. The sleeping terror in him would have lain asleep. It was something that was being awakened in him, an image incarnate of outward conditions, as cruel, as ugly, as maleficent as were those outward conditions. But if the strike continued then, she feared with reason, would this other and grisly self of Billy strengthen the fuller and more forbidding stature? And this, she knew, would mean the wreck of their love life. Such a Billy she could not love. In its nature, such a Billy was not lovable nor capable of love. And then, as the thought of offspring, she shuddered. It was too terrible. At such moments of contemplation, from her soul, the inevitable plaint of the human went up. Why, why, why? Billy, too, had his unanswerable queries. Why won't the building trades come out, he demanded wrathfully, of the obscurity that veiled the ways of living and the world. But no, O'Brien won't stand for a strike, and he has the building trades council under his thumb. But why don't they chuck him and come out anyway? We'd win hands down all along the line. But no, O'Brien's got their goat, and him up to his dirty neck, in politics and graft. And damn the Federation of Labor. If all the railroad boys had come out, wouldn't the shopmen have won instead of being licked to a frazzle? Lord, I ain't had a smoke of decent tobacco or a cup of decent coffee in a coon's age. I've forgotten what a square meal tastes like. I weighed myself yesterday fifteen pounds lighter than when the strike begun. If it keeps on much more, I can fight middleweight, and this is what I get after paying dues into a union for years and years. I can't get a square meal. My wife has to make other men's beds. It makes my tired ache. Some day I'll get really huffy and chuck that lodger out. But it's not his fault, Billy, Saxon protested. Who said it was? Billy snapped roughly. Can't I kick in general if I want to? Just the same, it makes me sick. What's the good of organized labor if it don't stand together? For two cents, I'd chuck the whole thing up and go over to the employers. Only I wouldn't, God damn them. If they think they can beat us down to our knees, let them go ahead and try it, that's all. But it gets me just the same. The whole world's clean dippy. There ain't no sense in anything. What's the good of supporting a union that can't win a strike? What's the good of knocking the blocks off of scabs when they keep coming thick as ever? The whole thing's a bug house, and I guess I am too. Such an outburst on Billy's part was so unusual that it was the only time Saxon knew it to occur. Always he was sullen and dogged and unwhipped, while whiskey only served to set the maggots of certitude crawling in his brain. One night, Billy did not get home till after twelve. Saxon's anxiety was increased by the fact that police fighting and head-breaking had been reported to have occurred. When Billy came, his appearance verified the report. His coat sleeves were half torn off. The Windsor tie had disappeared from under his soft turned-down collar, and every button had been ripped off the front of the shirt. When he took his hat off, 
Saxon was frightened by a lump on his head the size of an apple. Do you know who did that? That Dutch slob Hermanman, with a riot club. And I'll get him for it some day, good and plenty. And there's another fellow I've got staked out that'll be my meat when this strike's over and things is settled down. Blanchard's his name, Roy Blanchard. Not of Blanchard, Perkins, and company, Saxon asked, busy washing Billy's hurt and making her usual fight to keep him calm. Yup, except he's the son of the old man. What he'd do? That ain't done a tap of work in all his life except to blow the old man's money. He goes strike-breaking. Grandstand play, that's what I call it. Gets his name in the papers and makes all the skirts he run with fluster up and say, My, some bear, that Roy Blanchard, some bear. Some bear? The gazebo? He'll be bear meat for me some day. I never itched so hard to lick a man in my life. And oh, I guess, I'll pass that Dutch cop up. He got his already. Somebody broke his head with a lump of coal the size of a water bucket. That was when the wagons was turning into Franklin, just off Eighth, by the old Galindo Hotel. There was hard fighting there, and some guy in the hotel lamps that coal down from the second-story window. There was fighting every block of the way, bricks, cobblestone, and police clubs to beat the band. They don't dast call out the troops, and they was afraid to shoot. Why, we tore holes through the police force, and the ambulances and patrol wagons worked overtime. But say, we got the procession blocked at 14th and Broadway, right under the nose of the city hall, rushed to the rear end, cut out the horses of five wagons, and handed them college boys a few love pats in passing. All that saved them from hospital was the police reserve. Just the same, we had them jammed an hour there. You ought to seen the streetcars blocked, too. Broadway, 14th, San Pueblo, as far as you could see. But what did Blanchard do? Saxon called him back. He led the procession and drove my team. All the teams was from my stable. He rounded up a lot of them college fellows, fraternity guys, they're called, yaps that live off their father's money. They come to the stable in big touring cars and drove out the wagons with half the police of Oakland to help them. Say, it was sure some day, the sky rained cobblestones. And you ought to heard the clubs on our heads. Rat, tat, 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 rat, tat, tat, tat. And say, the chief of police, in a police auto, sitting up like God Almighty, just before we got to Peralta Street, there was a block and the police charging, and an old woman, right from her front gate, lammed the chief of police full in the face with a dead cat. Phew, you could hear it. Arrest that woman, he yells, with his handkerchief out. But the boys beat the cops to her and got her away. Some day, I guess, yes. The receiving hospital went out of commission, on the jump, and the overflow was spilled into St. Mary's Hospital and Fabiola, and I don't know where else. Eight of our men was pulled, and a dozen of the Frisco Teamsters that come over to help. They're holy terrors, them Frisco Teamsters. It seemed half the working men in Oakland was helping us, and they must be an army of them in jail. Our lawyers will have to take their cases, too. But take it from me, it's the last we'll see of Roy Blanchard and yaps of his kidney butting into our affairs. I guess we showed him some football. You know that brick building they're putting up on Bay Street? That's where we loaded up first, and say, you couldn't see the wagon seats for bricks when they started from the stables. Blanchard drove the first wagon, and he was not clean off the seat once, but he stayed with it. He must have been brave, Saxon commented. Brave, Billy fared with the police and the army and the navy behind him? I suppose you'll be taking their part next. Brave? A taking the food out of the mouths of our women and children? Didn't Curly Jones' little kid die last night? Mother's milk not nourishing, that's what it was, because she didn't have the right stuff to eat. 
and I know, and you know, a dozen old aunts and sisters-in-laws and such that had to hike to the poorhouse because their folks couldn't take care of them in these times. In the morning paper, Saxon read the exciting account of a futile attempt to break the Teamster's strike. Roy Blanchard was hailed as a hero and held up as a model of wealthy citizenship, and to save herself she could not help glowing with appreciation of his courage. There was something fine in his going out to face the snarling pack. A brigadier general of the regular army was quoted as lamenting the fact that the troops had not been called out to take the mob by the throat and shake law and order into it. This is the time for little healthful bloodletting, was the conclusion of his remarks, after deploring the pacific methods of the police. For not until the mob has been thoroughly beaten and cowed will tranquil industrial conditions obtain. That evening Saxon and Billy went uptown. Returning home and finding nothing to eat, he had taken her on one arm, his overcoat on the other. The overcoat he had pawned at Uncle Sam's, and he and Saxon had eaten drearily at a Japanese restaurant, which, in some miraculous way, managed to set a semi-satisfying meal for ten cents. After eating, they started on their way to spend an additional five cents each on a moving picture show. At the Central Bank building, two striking teamsters accosted Billy and took him away with them. Saxon waited on the corner, and when he returned, three-quarters of an hour later, she knew he had been drinking. Half a block on, passing the Forum Café, he stopped suddenly. A limousine stood at the curb, and into it a young man was helping several wonderfully gowned women. A chauffeur sat in the driver's seat. Billy touched the young man on the arm. He was as broad-shouldered as Billy and slightly taller. Blue-eyed, strong-featured, in Saxon's opinion, he was undeniably handsome. Just a word, sport, Billy said, in a low, slow voice. The young man glanced quickly at Billy and Saxon and asked impatiently, Well, what is it? You're Blanchard, Billy began. I seen you yesterday lead out that bunch of teams. Didn't I do it all right? Blanchard asked gaily, with a flash of glance to Saxon and back again. Sure, but that ain't what I want to talk about. Who are you? the other demanded with sudden suspicion. A striker. It just happens you drove my team, that's all. No, don't move for a gun. As Blanchard had half reached toward his hip pocket. I ain't starting anything here, but I just want to tell you something. Be quick, then. Blanchard lifted one foot to step into the machine. Sure, Billy went on, without any diminution of his exasperating slowness. What I want to tell you is that I'm after you. Not now, when the strike's on, but sometime later I'm going to get you and give you the beating of your life. Blanchard looked Billy over with new interest and measuring eyes that sparkled with appreciation. You are a husky yourself, he said, but do you think you can do it? Sure, you're my meat. All right then, my friend. Look me up after the strike is settled and I'll give you a chance at me. Remember, Billy added, I've got you staked out. Blanchard nodded, smiled genially to the both of them, raised his hat to Saxon, and stepped into the machine. End of Section 27